I honestly think I'm gonna give The Patrick Show its own lore video one day. If Planet Sheen can get one, so can this. She's literally so strong and brave. I am so brave. What lovers? Welcome back to the lore series where we discuss shows no one else is brave enough to. Now as always, the shows I cover have a demographic of kids, but that is not my demographic. Don't believe me? Check the stats. You didn't have to take out receipts, Jesus. If it doesn't make sense to you, you wouldn't be the first one. I'm just letting you know up front. So guys, spinoffs are a totally other breed. Last spinoff I covered in the lore series was Planet Sheen. I'm, I'm a fucking liar. So I thought I knew what I was getting myself into this time with the Patrick Star Show. Boy oh boy. Boy, I overestimated myself. First of all, my uninformed ass thought all of season two already aired. It didn't. It fully didn't. The United States is airing episodes of The Patrick Star Show four months later than they're being released in the UK. So we're beefing with England again. Everyone grab your tea and meet me at the harbor at once. But despite new episodes still being released, I am overwhelmed as it is. So let's overanalyze together. Are you ready, young adults to adults? Aye, aye, Captain. I can't hear you. But first. If the Athena P channel has taught you anything, it's that adults can enjoy Saturday morning cartoons too. And for that, we need a cereal just as magical, which is why this video's sponsor is Magic Spoon. What's so magical about it? Well, it tastes incredible. My favorite flavor is frosted with a close second being fruity. And I'm gonna show you a life hack because I love chocolate and peanut butter too, but watch this. I combine them. Is that allowed? Sure is, just don't tell my mom. Actually, you can tell my mom because this cereal has zero sugar, is high protein, high quality, and fueling. Click the link below to grab a variety pack and try today. And be sure to use the promo code AthenaP at checkout for $5 off your order. Or go to magicspoon.com slash AthenaP to save $5 today. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund you your money, no questions asked. So click the link below or scan the QR code or go to magicspoon.com slash Athena P to save $5. Thank you so much to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video. It was delicious. I freaking loved it. Now back to. Yeah, we're starting here because in 2021, Nickelodeon premiered Camp Coral and The Patrick Star Show. They released two SpongeBob spinoffs back to back, one about SpongeBob and friends as babies and the other about Patrick Star and friends as teens with a totally new family they made for him. This on top of the fact that in 2009, Steven Hillenburg, the creator of SpongeBob, said he didn't see any spinoffs of the show, sent fans into a frenzy. Public opinion was that Nickelodeon worked on these shows without the creator's awareness. And it's especially difficult to fully refute that public opinion since Steven Hillenburg unfortunately passed away in 2018. This led fans to creating petitions such as this one, get Nickelodeon to respect SpongeBob creator's wish for no spinoffs, cancel Camp Coral. I believe I actually signed this petition back in 2019 when it was posted. And this petition got over 30 39,200 signatures, which is definitely nothing to scoff at. Although Nickelodeon probably did, if we're being honest. And the petition description made several good points calling Nickelodeon's greed into question. One damning piece of evidence was a tweet from Paul Tibbet, who had a major hand in creating SpongeBob and making it what it was. Tibbet tweeted, I do not mean any disrespect to my colleagues who are working on the show. They are good people and talented artists, but this is some greedy, lazy executiving right here. And they all know full well Steve would have hated this. Shame on them. And some of you out there may be thinking, no shit, a network cares about money. I like money. That'll always be the case. But it makes reviewing this objectively very difficult. I grew up on SpongeBob and I'm a creator myself. And I want to give credit where it's due for the parts of the show that are actually good. And there's a lot more good parts than I was anticipating, if I'm being honest. But also the creator not being here makes the parts that fall flat all the more sour. And in that way, it must be so intimidating for the animators and writers who are working on the show and genuinely trying their best. And I do want to support those people, but at the same time, do I even like this show? I'm confused. Enough dilly-dallying. Who are you people? We follow Patrick Starr, the titular bitchler, and his family that live in this very lively surrealist coffee it's pot. No hot. wonder they're always so energized. They're constantly caffeinated. <laughs> same. 
His family is made up of his dad, Cecil, his mother, Bunny, his sister, Squidina, and his paternal grandfather, Grandpat. The one thing we hear about Squidina in the, I was gonna say theme song, but, but it's more of a monologue, is that she's shy. And that's not even true. We see her shyness twice. And then she was immediately over it, playing a major part in their live theatrical production and their television show on stage and on camera. So yes, The Patrick Show is an in-universe television show produced and edited by Swadina and starring Patrick, but they also perform for the people that loiter in their front lawn in this cardboard box extension of their house. Sounds pretty straightforward, right? Yeah, it's all smooth sailing from here. <laughs> SS Super Minnow is a spaceship with the shark captain Doug Quasar. He has an assistant named Patron, who you can probably tell is just Robot Patrick. This universe gives me big Hanna-Barbera vibes. Physical comedy, simple story, an ode to early cartoons, perhaps. We even see Patrick watching this cartoon from his couch. Now, if this guy had even an ounce of self-awareness, he'd realize this is just Joan is awful from Black Mirror. My guy, that is you. A reflection of you seen in a mirror. That is black, black mirror. Little did I know this was just the start of the Patrick theme multiverse and they're actually way more connected than just this. I'm just gonna say it, the episode Patathon was hilarious. Seeing these characters parodying a telethon was golden. We have Patrick happy crying after raising zero dollars. Squidward was forced to answer these phones and every time somebody called in, they were just insulting him. And SpongeBob is the one raising the money to figure out what sickness Gary has that makes him incapable of dance. But one of the funniest parts was Patrick asking his mom to make her tattoo dance. And this bit just goes on for so long. I love Patrick's mom so much, by the way. She's probably my favorite of all the new characters, and she's completely underutilized. The tattoo dance then transitions into the first appearance of the stop motion Dr. Plankenstein. I mentioned this in my last SpongeBob video. How does this stop motion world exist within the Patrick show? Pat Gore, not to be confused with Pat Gar, the prehistoric Patrick, his name is Pat Tar. I don't know how I manage to mispronounce one name per video. I think if I don't, I'll die. Is Igor in this SpongeBob Frankenstein's monster world? And Pat Gore is watching the TV, exclaiming that he wants to call into the Patrick Show telethon. What a weird sentence from start to finish. As always, prepare to get weirder. The stop motion horror movie parody visuals they use here genuinely deserves props. Like, even if you're not a fan of this show, you can admit that this is cool. This goofy, silly section ends with Dr. Plankenstein trying to kill the Spongebob uh, monster? Hmm. They put silly music over it, but it still weirded me out. You're too soft! Ow! He even uses a chainsaw to cut back into the main plot. This show is moving so fast and throws so much at me. It gives me the vibes Chowder does, where even when I find it interesting, it exhausts me by the end. It feels like I watched 10 episodes instead of just one. Terror at 20,000 Leagues is a big episode for Plankenstein because this is when we learn that Squidina and Patrick are able to interact directly with them. These stop motion creatures live in the same town. Dr. Plankenstein is divorced to Plankenstein's bride, this world's version of Karen. But this is so bizarre because Frankenstein's bride is supposed to be for the monster, not the scientist. In this universe, did Plankton make Karen for SpongeBob to marry? And then decide, you know what? I'm just gonna keep her for myself. This is foul. I'm so glad Karen divorced his ass in this universe. Because have we ever talked about how weird it is that Plankton created his wife? Like even main series Plankton, I'm looking at you too. In the same episode, we see space robot Patrick again, also known as Patron. And he has a whole alien pop out of him, which is obviously a parody of the movie Alien. This show references a lot of other pieces of media. I was constantly catching references. We have multiple instances of teleportation through their TV. Once in Squidina's Little Helper, twice in Lost in the Couch, but Terror at 20,000 Leagues really expands on Patrick's ability to control this. Just like in the Fairly Odd Parents episode Channel Chasers, Patrick is able to use a magical remote. We also meet a barbarian Patrick named Pat the Hapless. In Blorp's Giving, we see that Patron's family is exactly like Patrick's family. And exactly like the prehistoric Patrick show. Their family is the only constant in this show, which I find pretty hilarious, because they were nowhere to be found in the original show that this is a spin-off of. In this episode, we also have the one and only appearance of Inga Star and Ingatron, and she's there for the joke of, I'm not even joking, being their hot Swedish cousin. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. In the episode Superstars, we explore a world where radioactivity gave this family superpowers. Mr. Krabs is also the president of this world. Perfect character to put in this evil capitalistic position. <laughs> In the very first episode, we see Squidward as a delivery boy. And in the episode Bummer Jobs, it's revealed that Patrick's parents want him out of the house, so he's old enough to move out, but they also just introduced him to the concept of employment, which explains a lot. It's revealed in this episode that SpongeBob is also looking for a job. And I'm not gonna lie, guys, if I were watching this and the SpongeBob show didn't exist, the main series didn't exist, I know for a fact I would look at SpongeBob and be like, wow, this guy's great, he should have his own show. Which is probably why they don't feature Spongebob as much as I think they should. He steals every scene he's in because he's main character material. But whatever, I digress. In the episode Who's a Big Boy, we hear Patrick singing the Spongebob theme song and making his doll Spongebob work at the Krusty Krab. So Patrick fully manifested that for Spongebob because nowhere in this series does Spongebob work at the Krusty Krab. In this same episode, we see Spongebob and Squidward's future houses being built next to each other beside a sign that says new homes come coming soon. Nitwit Neighbor News shows us that before Spongebob and Squidward worked at the Krusty Krab, Eugene Krabs was manning the register all on his own. We also have an incredibly out of character moment for Mr. Krabs to the point where it actually pisses me off. Mr. Krabs is being robbed and when the robber gets distracted, he boredly says, uh, can we get this robbery over with? Like he doesn't even care that he's taking his money? That is the one, that is the one characteristic this motherfucker has, is that he cares about money. Not a single tear down his cheek. He didn't care that he was being robbed. I, I mean, I, I mean. An ongoing joke throughout this series is Squidward angered beyond belief at Patrick's dad who doesn't pay for the paper. And the rivalry between newsboy Squidward and Cecil the Cheapskate is way deeper than we thought. This family rivalry between the tentacles and the stars has been going on for generations. Which feeds into my theory from my last video. Maybe I have a mini theory in the works that Patrick secretly hates Squidward. Squidward. <laughs> Pearl is about 10 years old, so around the same age as Squidina. So I guess these two grew up together, which makes sense because here they are in the main series. If you've ever seen the first Spongebob movie, you know that they get drunk off Gooberberry Sundays. They lean into this even more in the episode Enemies a la Mode, when Grandpa told of his childhood, when the lactose intolerant movement prohibited ice cream. During the ice cream prohibition, Grandpa snuck into ice cream speakeasies. There are a lot more ways this show interacts with the canon we learned about in the main series, but first let's Let's talk about more characters, because I didn't realize how Perch Perkins was going to steal the show. <laughs> oh, what a relic. Back to you! Perch Perkins' amusement of the elderly and casual ageism kills me every time. I already was a big fan of Perch, but this show makes him even funner. Oh my god. During the premiere of season two, Perch Perkins is also selling his own line of merch. These short shorts with the initials PP on the butt. I buy these in a heartbeat. Are you kidding me? Also, this episode was one of the better ones, but the mere mention of merch just hurts me right now. Maybe one day. Granny Tentacles is an ongoing opposing force. She's very fed up, just like her grandson, but she actually does something about it. Oftentimes, she'll feign kindness when other people are around, but secretly plotting their downfall behind their backs. Halfway through season one, it's revealed that Grandpat and Granny Tentacles are dating, like they're romantically involved. Grandpat even confirmed this in the episode Back Pay Payback, when he dropped the big old G word. No, not Gilf, what is wrong with you? Girlfriend, he said girlfriend. Speaking of grandmas, in the episode Which Witch is Witch, we meet Squidina and Patrick's maternal grandmother. So Bunny's mom, Agnes, is a squid witch. She doesn't like Patrick or Cecil or Grandpat, so she clearly has a problem with non-magical starfish. Despite the fact that she clearly used to be with one, I mean, look at her daughter. Bunny even talks about never meeting her mother's expectations because she doesn't possess this magical ability. So it turns out Squidina does possess this magic and is able to warp reality through editing. Every time I try and make sense of this clearly very episodic show, it throws a cream pie at me and farts in my face. Oh, she's a werewolf at the end of the episode. 
Cool. I mentioned the character Slappy Laszlo in my last Spongebob Bits video, but in case you missed it, he was introduced as Nosferatu's assistant. He's always a creepy, unnerving little weirdo. But wow, it just gets worse and worse with every episode he's featured in. In season two, we learn that he breaks into this family's house repeatedly. Wibbly wobbly, timey wimey stuff. The first time we see the time closet was in season one, episode six, Bunny the Barbarian, and they drop this information very casually. This show constantly yes ands without asking, but why? Actually, I do know why. Part of Grand Pat's old man shtick is saying back in my day and sending us to absurd time periods like prehistoric age or ancient Rome with the Clamecium. But every time he looks the same, he's still an old man. In the episode Yard Sale, we actually get a bit of clarity because he also mentions back when I was in the future. And we see the Clamecium again, but this time it's chrome because everything's chrome, chrome in, in the, the future. future. This plus the fact that he's old in every era, except for the 1920s in the episode The Little Pat Skulls. This is the first time we see him as a kid. Yes, he still has a beard, but he's tiny. This is canonically him as a kid. Every other time he says back in my day, it's just him having fun with the time closet. But let's talk about The Little Pat Skulls because in that episode, Patrick uses the time closet to join his grandpa on his childhood adventures, saving old man Jenkins from getting caught with ice cream during the prohibition. So they bring that back again. But what I really want to talk about is this ending shot when the group is back together. So that young squid octopus was granny tentacles. The tentacles are octopuses. That dude apparently was old man Walker. But we also see Mr. Krabs and Mrs. Puff in this aged up design we've never seen from them. I highly doubt those two are anywhere near the age of Grandpa. I feel like Mrs. Puff and Mr. Krabs are in their 60s and Grandpa, granny tentacles and old man Walker are anywhere between 80 and like 110. I'm genuinely so confused by this. In the episode Just in Time for Christmas, Patrick is traveling through time and space with the closet, trying to find the best gifts for his family. And there's a brief moment where Patron kisses Patrick. As if we don't have enough to unpack, we're throwing in self-cest. More on this later, if you can believe it. The butterfly effect focused on the consequences of time travel. The episode itself refers to the butterfly effect, which is the philosophical belief that tiny changes could impact the future in big ways. The first change we see is Patrick and his family turning into these half-car creatures. This leads to Patrick constantly going back in time to fix his mistakes. This trope is known as set wrong what was once made right, but this journey requires a lot of trial and error. In the biggest obstacle yet, one of his attempts to fix everything leads to a reality just like his own, but breakfast doesn't exist. But when he goes back to fix it, it's revealed that the time closet doesn't exist. I thought Patrick would just go to Sandy for help, but I actually like the direction they went in better. Patrick pursued higher education, showing that he is capable of intelligence when applying himself and he makes the time closet himself to stop past him from going in the first place. They don't really address the fact that this means smart Patrick will die, but I love this journey for Patrick because he takes full responsibility without leaning on anybody else for help too, and it was a long journey too. He overcomplicated the shit out of this, and I respect him for it. It felt like one of the only times he was the main character. Now don't get me wrong, we can follow incompetent main characters, I can think of many, but there has to be something else about them that's worth Worth following. I think this show is supposed to be led by the family, but because I don't like most of the family, I think that's why I enjoyed Patrick going on this solo journey, because if he's not having a buddy adventure with Spongebob or Squidward, I'd rather him just be alone. What's this dude capable of? Now let's talk about Patrick's self-obsession and weaponized incompetence. Patrick hosts an award show called the Starry Awards, which is also the name of the episode. It's a solid parody of award shows. The opening number was great. But the real reason I talk about this is because Patrick's host persona really shines through. And he is not a fan of nonsense he didn't pre-approve of. For example, when Plankenstein won Best Cutaway Segment, and they were all fighting over who would accept the award, Patrick crumbled them into a ball and threw them in a trophy off stage. The episode Fun and Done starts with Patrick watching a nature documentary where he sees our world's version of a sea star. We see it eat by extruding its stomach from its body. Patrick sees this, is at first a little disgusted, but then is intrigued, tries it, and it works. Patrick is applying what he learned about his own species. Patrick, when he puts just an ounce of effort in, isn't really that stupid. His stupidity is a result of his extreme laziness, which probably stems from him putting himself first every time. In the game show parody episode, Patrick poisons his parents, 
And then he gave them a gastro pump and look at how they present it. I laugh. I laugh, I'll admit it. By the end of the episode, when the family confronts him about how shitty he's been, his rebuttal is essentially, but the views were great. I really enjoyed his shitty influencer-like behaviors. I want more of this energy. This is a more compelling main character, just an absolute douchebag. Oh, and by the way, this game show parody episode ends with a Transformers parody. What? This show is bonkers. If you were to give me a million dollars to correctly predict how any of these Patrick Starr show episodes episodes end, I wouldn't win that fucking money. In the episode A Space Affair to Remember, we witness Patrick's egotistical, self-obsessed vanity as he plays spin the bottle with different versions of himself. And he is very hyped to smooch Cave Pat. And not one of the versions of Patrick thought, hey, this is pretty fucking weird. Is he kind of based though? Would I kiss myself? Pro probably. In the episode Super Sitter, SpongeBob and Patrick go back in time to discover a super daycare. And the tagline reads, a preschool for future superheroes. And we see Baby Mermaid Man and Baby Barnacle Boy, but we also see Baby Dirty Bubble and Baby Man Ray. In one of Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy's origin stories, they got their powers as young men, but here it seems that they're more like Superman, just a super alien race. The daycare appears to be a spaceship that they all crash landed in, but what I really wanted to talk about is we see these villain origin stories play out, as SpongeBob and Patrick clearly don't understand the consequences of telling these kids exactly who they end up being. Actually, what's worse than that is they do realize they are totally content messing with these people's whole lives because they're just such a big fan of the show and they wanted to witness them beating each other up as babies so badly that they altered these kids futures and created supervillains. Somehow the heroes and villains found this out and were pissed. The episode ends with Spongebob and Patrick being chased by them. Weirdly enough, this level of shittiness and self-awareness can actually lend itself to pretty unique storylines. Planet Sheen only leaned into Sheen's stupidity, and while the Patrick Star Show is guilty of doing that 75% of the time too, it's clear that there's more here. That's just a theory. Uh the first thing that caught my eye about the design of this show is that when you look in the sky, you see the flowers like how you do in Spongebob. Bob, but there's also these strange star-shaped clouds. Then in one episode, as Patrick was watching TV flipping through the channels, we saw a shot of live-action human bowling. So at this point, undersea life and land life are so interconnected that we've become a part of each other's recreation. We know that this isn't one-sided because A, we're watching them right now, Not your and B, as Alex Bale's theory discussed, the whole SpongeBob series is being documented by humans to study the Bikini Bottom residents. Speaking of which, are we in Bikini Bottom right now? Like in the Patrick show, where is this? So I researched intensely by Googling it. And this Reddit post from the user Ed Daughter blew my mind. Was watching the Patrick Star show and realized that it takes place in Ukulele Bottom. This place was mentioned in I Was a Teenage Gary from season one. So iconic that it takes place in Ukulele Bottom when plenty of people think that they should apologize for even making the show. They did whip out the ukulele. But this has nothing to do with the star-shaped clouds, as we have also seen Bikini Bottom in this series, and the stars were still in the sky. In the episode Stair Wars, we see a human audience react with total unamusement. Which brings me back to Alex Bale's TV show within a TV show theory. Because this leans into it in a much more sinister way. According to that theory, the original Spongebob series is just people documenting life under the sea and trying to interfere as little as possible. But this feels more like like aquarium life. This seems like humans are meddling in a way that alters their reality entirely. The sky even looks like it was created by a set designer with Crayola crayons and a dream. We also see snow sitting on the sky flowers and stars, pointing to this once again maybe being a painted set. Maybe these human scientists studying radiation wanted to hold people's attention and their views and their money, so they cloned the main characters of the original series and plopped them into different worlds. I mean, the end credits clearly show other versions of Patrick that we've never even met. A new Spongebob episode in the main series clearly shows Sandy perfecting teleportation. And Camp Coral shows her talking to an alternate version of her younger self. I knew sending you to Camp Coral was the right thing to do. So it's clear that Sandy is in on the production and research of this show slash cloning experiment. 
We even see a mini fish tank containing a pineapple and the Krusty Krab. One thing that kind of took me out of this is in the episode of Space Affair to Remember, when Bunny and Cecil were in space, they entered this weird contest, and one of the challenges was cooking humans? But maybe this is just VR, because I've never seen cartoon humans in Spongebob. Usually they're live action, unless you consider Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy and Man Right to be humans, but I don't, so I don't think they're real humans. I could buy the aquarium cloning, but my second theory is that it's just a different timeline along with Camp Coral. It's not really a theory so much as it is just true. In the episode Neptune's Ball, we discover that the Patrick Star Show acknowledges jacked, non-bald, non-father, non-movie Neptune, otherwise known as the King Neptune I don't fucking acknowledge. And boy does this character get even worse in this show. Patrick and his family accidentally crash King Neptune's party, and they make a huge mess which was mostly unintentional except for Grandpat leading a hunt into the ballroom. Anyway, the first thing King Neptune hears is that there's commoners at his party, and he responds with, ugh, yuck. Typical politician bullshit. Your Honor, down with the monarchy, behead this fool. He doesn't even have the true trauma and depth of the real King Neptune. What's his trauma, you may ask? Um... Bald. This King Neptune also completely changes his tune when he realizes THE Patrick Star from The Patrick Show is the one that crashed his party. So now them destroying his castle is quirky and cute, but if they were commoners, he would have locked them up. Or worse. But wait, Patrick's thoughts are shown in the same crayon juvenile style as the Sky Stars. Could this show be all in his mind? In The Patrick Show Sells Out, we see rivaling sponsorships from the Krusty Krab and the Chum Bucket. But what this episode also shows us is that these alternate universes are now part of the show within the show. Quasar and Patron had a whole commercial about Krabby Patties, until Plankton interrupted to do his own smear campaign with Barbarian Patrick. It's worth noting that this section ends with the reveal that Plankton and Mr. Krabs were essentially improv with props the whole time. So how much of these realities are real in this reality, really. We have the most unreliable narrators in the world. Also, this episode addresses Alex Bale's Krabby Patties are made from Pearl's mother theory pretty directly. And I'd say even confirms it? Plankton shouts, Krabby Patties are made using whale oil. And Krabs' response was gasping at the horror that he went there, but he never denied it. Mr. Krabs' rebuttal? You leave my daughter out of this! Probably the most suspicious thing you could say? Officer, does this count as a confession? Yum, yum, yum. I love donuts. Before Plankton revealed the whole Krabby Patties are made using whale oil thing, he said other things for the Mr. Krabs puppet to say in a very mocking tone. Things like, My name's Eugene. I don't wipe my own ass. But he said the whale oil thing in just his regular voice. It was just a very factual tone. Yeah, so as much as I love my aquarium clone theory, the Patrick multiverse theory, or the series just existing in his mind, makes more sense. This show is way too episodic to try and fit all the pieces together. In fact, let's look at all the times we've seen Patrick die. The villain industry in Bikini Bottom is thriving. When Man Ray gets released from prison, we see him kidnap a child and place said child into an evil orphanage. These villains are creating other villains. Why is no one stopping them? Om um, nom nom, I'm a cop, I love donuts. Anyway, Man Ray is trying to get to his secret hideout, which is now located underneath Patrick Starr's family's house. Shenanigans ensues, and this episode ends with Patrick finding Man Ray's bomb. And that bomb blows up the entire world. These characters poof out of existence, and then a time card reads, The next day in a parallel universe. The Patrick Star Show really took the Rick and Morty approach to the multiverse. That time closet may really come in handy if Patrick needs to bury himself. The episode Stunton ends with Grandpa and Patrick being fused together before being eaten by Squidina. 
The Story Awards ends with Granny, Tentacles, Patrick, and Squidina fully dying after Granny hit a bomb in one of their awards. If that isn't enough, Cecil Starr, the father of Patrick and Squidina, is in the audience completely unfazed at the fact that he just watched his two children get killed. I know this makes me sound like a baby, but if I watched this as a kid, I think I genuinely would have been disturbed. In Ali Ali Organ Free, Patrick's organs quit and exit his body, leading him to look deflated. He goes on a flat Stanley-like adventure that goes terribly really fast. So Patrick starts swallowing household appliances and furniture and gains all of their abilities, which makes sense considering his dad is also mechanical, as seen in To Dad and Back. In this episode, Patrick opens up fan mail and a stereotypical little German boy emerges from the envelope saying, how does my body work? Now, as a fellow influencer, you don't answer those kind of questions, but Patrick doesn't give a shit. He's got that Miss Frizzle in him, so he decides to travel inside his dad. There's gotta be a better way of phrasing that. Um, he crawls in his dad. No, like I said, very magic school bus type stuff. The only difference is instead of shrinking down with the machine, he changes the viewer's perspective by running away from the camera and that act alone makes him tiny. You know how you can pretend to squish someone's far away head for a picture and you look like a giant and they look small? In this world, that's how they actually turn small. I feel like I'm on every drug. Then Patrick's dad takes off his socks to reveal his feet to remind you that you're watching Nickelodeon. Yeah, yeah, let's get an even closer shot of, of Patrick. Patrick entering through his dad's toenail. Yeah, let's do that. I'm not queasy. I'm not disgusted at all. Patrick's dad is fully mechanical with little inside out like creatures, plus an accordion for lungs. The episode ends with a Bill Foggerbocky voice of Patrick starved live action jump scare. I genuinely love when they do that. And also the reveal that the little German boy is casually living in Patrick's dad's body now. Dude, I don't know. Where was I? Oh, so in Ali Ali Organ Free, it makes sense that Patrick is able to take on the abilities of the appliances because he is half machinery on his dad's side. You with me? Meanwhile, Patrick's organs are being harvested at a deli. I'm constantly surprised at this show's ability to just go there. The organs and Patrick reunite, he gets his old body back, but immediately gets crushed, saying that now he needs new organs. What interesting last words. Yeah, I'm gonna count that as a death. At the end of season two's There Goes the Neighborhood, we meet this alien whose limbs are Patrick's neighbors. Did they stick to just background characters? No. One of his limbs was Granny Tentacles. One of his limbs was Slappy Laszlo. He reminds me of the ice cream old lady tongue monster from the Spongebob movie, but if it made even less sense. But it's okay because episodic and multiverse or something. It's a show for seven-year-olds. And finally, in the episode The Root Galoot, Patrick finds this root dude named Schmandrake. Schmandrake tells them that he'll grant the wish of whoever he likes the best. Squidina immediately recognizes that this rude root is scamming them. After a series of silly events, this episode ends with the family eating Schmandrake. He comes back to life horrified at what's happened to his body, and he runs away. Squidina confronts him and says that she wishes she never met him, and he gladly grants her wish. We are brought back to the beginning of the episode, but instead of Schmandrick, Patrick finds a magic lamp in the ground. Squidina exasperatedly exclaims that she wishes this cartoon was over already, and the magic lamp grants her wish. There's enough fourth wall breaking to suggest that this entire show takes place in Patrick or Squidina or some other character's imaginations. The biggest game of them all is... The Super Bowl! <laughs> How is your comedy ending the war? As I was researching and watching for this video, I would take breaks on TikTok and I saw my whole For You page flooded with the Nickelodeon Super Bowl. That's right, in the year 2024, SpongeBob's voice actors were improving for hours, commentating on the Super Bowl live. And some clips were very amusing. Larry the Lobster on the field flexing. SpongeBob implying him and Plankton were in a relationship at one point. Plankton, just for that, we are never getting back together. It was unhinged. It was nostalgic. They played Sweet Victory. And honestly, I'm really freaked out. They are successfully evolving the SpongeBob brand beyond the initial show. That's the point of all of this. The spin-offs, having the characters host a major sporting event. They still want to appeal to fans 
fans of the original show, obviously. But they also want SpongeBob's legacy to resemble that of Mickey Mouse, in that you can just plop that dude anywhere. There's so many Mickey Mouse shows, movies, attractions, crossovers. That's why Mickey Mouse is so hard to pin down in the public domain. Steamboat Willie entered the public domain, but not all the other Mickey Mouses. Maybe Nickelodeon is playing the long game. Someday, season one SpongeBob with the green holes may enter the public domain. But that's separate from CG SpongeBob. That's separate from Baby Camp Coral SpongeBob. That's separate from Teenage SpongeBob with a little tuft of sponge hair. I genuinely think that's their goal. And this Paramount merger is just amplifying their original goal of making money even more. Imagine a Mr. Krabs on crack, if you will. They would stream a steaming pile of shit for 10 hours if they thought that would get them money. Meanwhile, Noggin is shutting down and about 800 employees are being laid off. It's difficult to enjoy even the most creative ways these beloved characters from my childhood are evolving when I know it's at the expense of other creations and other creators. <laughs> It's better than Planet Sheen, in my opinion. That much I can say for sure. But it's so hard to pin down if I like this series as a whole, because A, everything I just talked about, and B, the quality of these episodes is so inconsistent. The gross out humor truly tainted my watch experience. The episode The Drooling Fool is one of the grossest ones. Patrick sleeps on the ceiling, so when he has one of his classic ice cream dreams, Squidina notices a pool of drool. Then Patrick falls mouth first on her, so he bored his little little sister. She runs up and down the inside of his body before escaping. And when she wakes him up, his eyes burst through his eyelids with his mouth still overflowing with saliva. Oh, you think it can't get worse? Patrick's dad even tried to cork his son's drooling mouth with his armpit cork. <clears throat> this has very similar vibes to that toenail episode of Spongebob. Shock out humor never lands for me. I just feel queasy and sad. Speaking of sad, the episode Dad Stash opens with such a weak joke. Just an absolute stinker. When Patrick exclaims how much he wants a mustache, he talks about how everyone has a mustache. Even mom has a mustache. And this joke could have been great if she embraced it like that family guy looking Daphne from Scooby-Doo. Or if she was just indifferent to it. But instead, Bunny Star reacts with embarrassment. And it just makes me sad. Not even sea stars are free from misogynistic beauty standards. Hate to see it. I wish I could tell her how beautiful she is. But then, abrupt tone shift to one of the funniest things this show has ever given us. Oh, that mustache. That mustache must never be worn. What do you mean? The voice acting, the animation, like these frames are so iconic to me. I burst out laughing. The mustache Patrick wasn't supposed to wear that he obviously wore turned him into an old timey villain. He tied his family to train tracks and his father Cecil had to save the day with his mustache related powers that we've never seen and will never see again. Really solid episode. Here's another moment I'm very glad came out of the show. Have you guys heard this song? I'm gonna link it, you gotta check it out because I feel like if I play it, the video will- Okay, so watch it and come back. I'm about to spoil it in three, two, one. Smacked in the face with the wonderful world of friendship. That explosion was not me editing. That was in the show. I'm actually pissed that I can't find this full episode. It aired in the UK already, but not the United States. And dare I say, I'm looking forward to watching it. What the fuck? I'm excited to watch an episode of the Patrick Star Show. That's not how I thought this video would end. So as much as it would be easier to dismiss this show altogether, there are a lot of talented animators and writers working on this show that are trying their best with what they're given. Two things can be true at once. Nickelodeon can be super disrespectful. Look at how unceremoniously they threw out noggin. But that doesn't mean the people that work on it don't care, so I'm so on the fence. On top of that, I completely understand the people out there that only acknowledge the Spongebob episodes that Steven Hillenburg had a direct hand in making. And I don't blame you. I will offer this perspective though. I hear a lot of people being like, oh, new Spongebob is ruining old Spongebob. And I don't get that. The old episodes of Spongebob exist as is. It's not like they're editing the old episodes. They are still there. You can watch them. The newer stuff doesn't taint that. Yeah, I don't know. There are scenes I hate. There are scenes I genuinely love. That friendship song is so iconic. So do I like the show? I can say for certain I don't hate it. And I feel like I should, but I don't. 
Sorry. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed. Be sure to subscribe if you did. Next week, I'm comparing Teletubbies and Booba in a lore light. I'll explain what that is in the next video. Have a great day, butt lovers. Bye!